good morning from my end to everybody. Um, and a big thank you to Johannes Glückler and Laura and everybody else who organized this terrific symposium. Um, when I uh, got the email about the topic, civil society um, and, and knowledge, I was actually quite um, excited because I had, um, I've spent, you know, I, I think much of my um, academic career thinking about civil society one way or another. I, I did a book early on um, on civil society, education between state markets and civil society. Um, I wrote a, another book recently about the university comparing the German and American university where I'm arguing that uh, one of the big advantages of the American university is that it's embedded not in the state but in the civil society um, from which derive many of its, um, you know, uh, the features that make it world renowned. <coughs> At the same time, I, uh, along the way, I've sort of lost my faith in the civil society, I, uh, 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 I have to say. Um, and because much of the things that I had in my early enthusiasm expected the civil society to deliver did not really come true. So I'm using this talk as an opportunity to think my way through these um, predicaments and conflicting thoughts. I do want to uh, um, very much regain my faith, uh, if, if that's a, a good way of putting it. Um, but I also don't want to dismiss the, the serious um, um, issues and, and challenges to the civil society that I see. Um, if I had to narrow down my focus a little bit, I would say I want to argue against two um, sort of work my way towards a positive appreciation um, um, recovery of civil society by, by, by arguing against two detracting views of the civil society. The first one um, where civil society is seen as just a band-aid on the uh, wounds of capitalism, you know, uh, where the uh, exploiters um, keep the exploited um, at um, you know, peace, um, or, um, some version of it. Um, David Harvey, actually, uh, who gave talks in this, in the predecessor to this symposium, I think, uh, is a proponent of that view. And I uh, caught a glimpse of that uh, just the other day. So he said, NGOs have grown and proliferated under neoliberalism, neoliberalism giving rise to the illusion that opposition mobilized outside of the state ap apparatus and within some separate entity called civil society is the powerhouse of oppositional politics and social transformation. And he very much argues against that uh, um, idea of civil society. Um, and I you know, will disagree with him on that. Um, the other view I want to argue against is that, uh, which is one that I held myself for quite a while, which is that civil society can do no wrong, that the more of, uh, there is of civil society, the better, and conversely, the less uh, state-produced services and uh, provisions there are, the better. I want to argue against both of these views. Um, <coughs> on the first position, I want to um, point out uh, that we owe civil society institutions many praiseworthy and uh, benevolent social inventions, social discoveries. Uh, in my own work, I would very much point to the American University, uh, uh, which would not have been possible but for the mega millions that poured in from philanthropy, um, people like uh, some more appealing than others, uh, like Ezra Cornell, my alma mater, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, but also Andrew Carnegie, who, as we heard, um, could be quite a bastard when it came to um, his workers. Um, but he did uh, line up with Charles Eliot, and they together uh, arguably created the blueprint for the modern uh, 
university to which all the world is aspiring to uh, to to, uh, to emulate today. So. Um, I, uh, without that, uh, um, we would still be at a point where Karl Jaspers argued that without the state, the university is helpless. The American university has proven that, this, that it doesn't need the state to do its work. And that's, I think, a very, very important uh, uh, human discovery that we owe to the civil society. To the second position, I want to argue um, that civil society is not always clearly distinct from a phenomenon that looks superficially similar but is substantively very different, um, which is the gilded society, which also has a lot of self-organization outside of the state, a strategic role of ph philanthropy, lots of private production of goods that look like public goods, uh, but in reality, we're really talking about a different animal. So to disambiguate uh, between civil society and gilded society, um, I, I think we need to probe more deeply the first part of the term, civil society, namely the civil aspect, and ask more, more seriously uh, what we mean by civility. Um, and um, I sh have come to believe that we actually need to sh need to in in enrich our arsenal of um, sciences that we draw on, and when we think about the civil society, and add to sociology and political theory, which are sort of the go-to's for most people to think about civil society, and add uh, moral philosophy um, and ethics. Uh, I really think uh, without drawing on those. Uh, fields, we cannot uh, come to a good understanding of what we mean, what we can reasonably mean by civility. Um, <coughs> and in particular, I want to argue, suggest that um, um, Aristotelian virtue ethics uh, should play a key role in this. So, <coughs> um, I want to look at, in, in the course of the next 30 or 30 plus minutes, uh, at, at some of these questions. Um, <clears throat> it, can the civil society, is the civil society always a good thing? Can it be corrupted? Can it um, move, uh, can it shift from, um, you know, um, uh, an arena of civility to an arena of, um, um, you know, uh, corrupted politics, uh, uh, economics, and so forth? What's the relationship between civility and, and Aristotelian virtue? And uh, I want to point to some of the deceptive similarities between civil and gilded society institutions drawing on my own research in, in education. <coughs> um, I want to make this the first part a little bit um, autobiographical. As I say, in one author's learning curve, I started as an enthusiast, I uh, came to a um, midpoint of uh, deep skepticism. I hope I'm able to recover uh, that. Um, <coughs> when I first latched onto the civil society, it was out of, out of this look, all these things can be done without the state. Uh, my second phase was, <coughs> was this, um, you know, look ma, there's no virtue here, um, as in the gilded society. Um, I want to uh, I can also describe this um, by mentioning some of my, you know, main go-to people in 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 this um, line of work, um, and some of them you are obviously familiar with, and some may maybe not so much. Um, an early inspiration was uh, Willem van Humboldt's um, not so well-known uh, essay on the limits of state action. That's the English title. Die Grenzen der Wirksamkeit des Staates, um, <coughs> where he, as a 25, 26 year old young um, man, um, sort of um, leaning a lot on Ferguson and, and uh, other Anglo Saxon um, writers on the civil society, but adding a lot um, of his own uh, thinking, drawing on, on, on his, um, you know, very a profound familiarity with Greek 
uh, philosophy, um, creating a, a, an argument uh, that points to the need uh, uh, for free societies being uh, independent of the state, uh, where state is really limited to uh, very minimalist uh, um, activities, education being distinctly not a state responsibility. This is Humboldt who 15 years uh, later becomes the Minister of Education of Prussia and one of the most centralized uh, you know, education machineries, a very interesting uh, career both personally and philosophically would, would be a subject for a separate discussion. John Stuart Mill on liberty, um, some may not know that he actually invokes Humboldt's essay in um, the preface to his On Liberty as one of his main inspirations for writing about you know, liberty and, and which has become a key document for civil society uh, thinking. Um, my own main source for thinking about the civil society is Tocqueville. I had the great fortune of, of spending a year at, at the Kennedy School at Harvard with David Reisman, and he talked me into uh, sitting down and reading The Democracy in America cover to cover, and it really changed the way I, 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 um, uh, I'm thinking um, about society. And um, I go back to reread it, and I've uh, recently um, you know, read it more from an Aristotelian uh, perspective. Um, and I think there's a lot that can, can still be um, brought to light there, um, especially the fact that Tocqueville thinks of the civil society really as an arena um, to make uh, where the mass of people, um, by entering uh, self-organized organized spaces of uh, civic, social, um, educational um, activity can move from self-interest to virtue. I really believe that's a very strong current in the democracy uh, uh, in America and that for him the, the, the whole, the, the chief um, promise of democracy, of modern American style democracy is that potential, not uh, no guarantee whatsoever, but that potential to pick people up where they are, which is mostly at a point of self-interest, and move them to a point of uh, what he calls self-interest properly considered, uh, namely um, of, of interest in, your, in, in, your, in the well-being of your fellow uh, humans. Um, a very, um, uh, I think you wouldn't find usually Jane Austen mentioned uh, uh, as a theorist of the civil society, but I like to think of uh, Pride and Prejudice as a real uh, contribution to our thinking of, of uh, ci what is civility. Uh, in, in Pride and Prejudice, she, she essentially argues that you cannot have civility if the two, two classes that she was dealing with, the, the English landed aristocracy and the commercial middle classes, insist on their own ways, the one being pride, the aristocracy, um, and um, uh, the middle classes being prejudiced against the aristocracy, that both need to come together in a new arena of gentleness, civility, uh, where they move beyond those uh, conceits. I think reading uh, Jane Austen that way, can we, we can learn a lot about what civility might, might mean for our age. <coughs> um, I'll um, keep the Aristotle reference short here. I, I do come back to that in the, in the end of the talk. I um, strongly believe that um, our discourse on civility has to connect I mean, in, in a way, it has never disconnected, but it has not been much, uh, made much explicit by many writers, has to con connect explicitly with the discourse on virtue ethics. Um, I think civility and virtue are essentially uh, uh, the same thing, um, but we have uh, dropped that link uh, um, to, uh, um, you know, in, in our contemporary discourse um, to our uh, peril. And then finally, Mark Twain, um, 
not only was he here, uh, as you know, uh, there's the Yankee in Heidelberg, right? A uh, uh, hundred years ago, something. Um, but he also coined the phrase, the Gilded Age. Um, uh, glittering on the surface and corrupt at the core. Um, so he's also a theorist of the civil society as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, sort of images to invoke what, I, what I'm talking about um, or in, in, um, in the first part of the talk. Um, this potential superficial likeness of civil and gilded society um, to me, the, the Supreme Court judgment on uh, money is speech uh, was a watershed event in American um, politics and American um, moral philosophy um, that, that basically removed any remaining barriers between market and uh, civil society. Um, this is, to me, a key um, fact um, that explains why the, the, the fabric and the complexion of uh, civil society has changed in the United States. I arrived in the US in 1983, which is about the um, point when inequality was as its at its lowest. In the time that I've been in the United States, um, it has moved from I like to think of this as the coast, uh, the, the borderline of the United States. So you start up there in, 18, uh, in 1900 in Seattle and you move down to Florida and you <coughs> go back up to New York. So I came to the US when we were in Florida um, and now we are up there in, um, in New York as far as income inequality goes. And I think you can have the same institutions, the same institutional structure in place as this moves from uh, Florida to New York, th the actual workings and the actual outcomes that you produce with these same institutions change, changes dramatically. And that's what I, what I have in mind when I talk about the superficiality. Then I will talk about two cases that I've researched, uh, worked on in my research um, um, from education that will, I think, illustrate what I mean by this um, potential superfici superficial resemblance. Endowments, university, you know, in perpetuity endowments, which are a key lever of uh, university independence, can also become instruments of oligarchy. And uh, education quality assessments can turn from useful knowledge uh, to uh, levers of standardization and mental uniformity. <coughs> um, Okay, so before I get there, I want to uh, uh, share a few reflections with you um, on, on um, my own experience um, of civil society, uh, describing how I fell in and out of love, if you will. So in 1983, I went from Göttingen University, Germany to Cornell University in the United States in what proved to be, in hindsight, a move from a state organized to a civil society organized uh, nation. In Germany, I had known and taken for granted a condition where even piano teachers and dog trainers must be licensed by the state, uh, where everything public, öffentlich, was by peremptory definition staatlich, i.e. state organized. By contrast, I was now part of a social situation where important public functions were lef left to groups of self-organizing citizens who were involved in grassroots and self-help associations of all sorts. I was struck by the fact that Americans could take freedoms for granted that in Germany could land you in jail, as for example, the practice of homeschooling. I, I met uh, a couple of friends uh, who had decided to, you know, uh, school their children at home. If you try that in Germany, you do end up in jail. Uh, and I think that's still the case even today. Um, uh, I remember my Prussian mindset experienced distinct disbelief that these parents were allowed to instruct their children um, or contract for their education themselves, although that's something that had been done just a century earlier all over Europe. Um, I mean, all the great scholars up until Hegel, 
were all homeschooled, you know. In, uh, um, um, universities and colleges could be in the U.S. privately governed, privately owned, um, privately, um, um, you know, uh, administered. Um, and you didn't need a Ministry of Education to run a world-class university. Even mundane freedoms like a parent being allowed to instruct their son or daughter in how to drive a vehicle without first obtaining permission from a government official struck me as a window on a different way of, uh, that Americans had about thinking about government and society relationships. I became an admirer of the American um, newspaper landscape, especially the New York Times uh, with its op-ed page, which seemed to me one of the best illustrations of, uh, the, for the power of reasonable deliberation. This was just a decade after the Washington Post had um, redefined the role of newspapers by publishing the Pentagon Papers, an act of defying government overreach that I could not easily imagine um, happening in Germany. I was charmed and impressed um, at how many of the most important and most admirable American institutions, hospitals, universities, museums, public parks, much of what, peop what attracts people to New York City, uh, were created not by state, uh, not by the state, nor funded by tax dollars, um, but by the philanthropic giving of private citizens or their foundations. As an exercise, mentally, you can you can walk through Manhattan and hit all the spots that you like to go to, and there's very little left when you detract uh, uh, the the institutions that have been created and funded by philanthropic. Um, activity, very little. Man, I mean, Manhattan becomes very unattractive once you, if you, you know, take, take all that away. Um, I also noticed the greater amount of liberty of thought, of belief, and of trust in local initiative. A tolerance for non-uniformity, for example. Trust in local initiative meant that you accept the fact that you may have a wonderful public library in one town and a fairly basic one in another. You don't wait to act until you can ensure wonderful libraries everywhere. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, you save yourself years of debating hypotheticals by allowing local individuals or groups to, uh, to just go ahead and try something. In comparison with what I saw in the US, the civic atmosphere uh, back home often seemed to oscillate between docile here and militant there. For the most part, there was great trust that the political authorities uh, would get things right. Um, but at the same time, every so often, there would be militant uh, um, opposition uh, to the authorities, unions, parties, social movements, demonstrations that would challenge some policy determination and lead to acrimonious contestations. Um, and, you know, uh, nothing wrong with that, but the space in between was not much cultivated. In contrast, I found recent debate involving strongly opposing viewpoints seemed a real power in the United States. Instead of mobilizing for a showdown of force, there was vigorous debate and trust and self-organization. Uh, conservatives like Christopher Buckley and liberals like uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan could present trenchant and often nerve-gratingly one-sided uh, views, but they would be received and, and um, you know, considered with respect and, and thoughtfulness. So for me, everything seemed to line up in the right direction. What aspirin was for health, the civil society was for democracy. In my own work on education, I found um, uh, value in Humboldt's, Tocqueville's, and Mill's shunning of mental uniformity, which required that the state was not the sole organizer of public education and finding that the civil society, not the market, was the right framework um, for school choice. In my book, The Design of the University, I paid recent homage to the um, uh, power of the civil society, arguing that the superior gifts of the American university are a result of being embedded not in the state, but in the civil society. But then something happened. I fell out of love with uh, the civil society, Frustration had gradually been building, but the watershed experience was were the events of 2008, when it turned out that not only had many of the chief protagonists of the American civil society purposefully concocted deceptive financial instruments that they knew would lead to the financial downfall of hundreds of thousands of small investors, 
Not only did they get away scot-free with their sins, duping the public into being too big to fail at the company level and too important to be prosecuted at the individual level, but on top of all that, they somehow perfidiously managed to saddle the first ever African-American presidency with digging the country out of that mess. To a card-carrying member of the Civil Society Club, this presented a major challenge. Instead of a space of self-organization -organi guided by norms of civility, the civil society, it seemed to me, increasingly seemed to operate like a space where might made right, in which uncivil, above-the-law oligarchs could buy their way to power, all the while the middle and working classes found themselves trampled on economically and shut up politically. Working and middle-class parents seemed too busy worrying about forfeiting their, forfeiting their mortgages to have any energy to partake in the self-governing activities of their respective associations and networks, to go bowling with friends, as Robert Putnam noticed, let alone to mobilize against the insanity of freely available automatic firearms that were used to wreak havoc on communities across the country in ever-shortening intervals. There were other signs as well that things were not right. Charter schools that I had initially um, supported as mechanisms to get out um, for public education to get out from under the bureaucratic micromanagement of um, often uninformed local school boards turned out to be just a vehicle of for-profit education management companies. Education and health care uh, were increasingly privatized. Students were saddled with exorbitant loans that often, college students, that often led to lifelong credit enslavement. And parents lost their home over a hospital bill for a cancer-struck child. <clears throat> there was no civil ri rights movement style, no civil rights style movement to f uh, fight back against these abuses. As authorities uh, um, lied to the U.S. and the world about weapons of mass destruction, there were no protests like Vietnam. You may say, of course, that my disillusion was predestined by the fact that my early love of the civil society had had all the realism of a teenage love affair. Um, and no infatuation is, un is sustainable, as we all know. Perhaps mine was just a case of losing the pink glasses and finally seeing the object of my desire in more realistic terms. But while I have to allow that my change of heart may have had an aspect of the cooling off of an unrealistic romance, I want to suggest here that something bigger and more important took place, a change in the American and more broadly global sociopolitical condition that came close to pulling the rug uh, out from under the civil society, not so much as an idea, but as an institutional practice. Put simply, things went from um, the market being a dimension of the civil society to um, the market being seen as being the ideal civil society. Uh, increasingly, uh, it was the market, not the civic-minded citizens, um, who became the, the market agent uh, who became the, piv um, the pivotal cultural hero in the United States. Uh, we went from a normative framework that still had a um, connection to the idea of civic virtue to one in which this idea can be um, flaunted with impunity. A, a, a learning experience for me was when I taught, you know, uh, Milton Friedman's thoughts on, on um, um, markets and uh, libertarianism, I, I noticed a footnote in his book, Free to Choose, which says that um, if it were feasible, practically feasible, we ought to fence in all the public parks in, in the big cities and charge entrance fees. So imagine Central Park in New York being fenced in and people having to pay $20 to get in what that would do to our sense of civility of an urban space, right? Um, but for him, you know, th that's just the same as, as charging, uh, um, uh, you know, when you use a highway, highway tolls. Uh, 
which is a very different category. I mean, yeah, let the users pay for this uh, uh, service. But, um, uh, you know, the fact that, is, that a, a shared space in a, in a city could be an, an arena of civility where classes meet uh, of different uh, background and, and, and so forth, that uh, does not register with, with, the, with the mind like, uh, you know, Milton Friedman's. Um, I will go over 10 minutes, I hope not more. Um, let me um, move now to um, two cases that I've worked on um, that um, have sort of further fed my skepticism about certain versions of the civil society. The first one is um, the higher education, um, you know, private university in endowment, um, which historically has been a major institutional building block for um, a a university independence and self-government. Uh, it's a very different institution that is funded largely or significantly, not even predominantly, but significantly from endowment income uh, compared to one that is completely dependent on tax handouts. Uh, um, you, you know, I mean, the, the, the difference in, in um, um, freedom of um, uh, choice for the people who run the institution is, is, is clearly uh, very different. The endowment has historically, uh, you know, quite a significantly um, forward pointing role, you know, first time mentioned in 1764 uh, at Brown University where um, it was made tax exempt. People, you know, who gave to a university endowment were considered to do a very, you know, seriously virtuous act. Um, but in the context of winner-take-all markets, um, as uh, Robert Frank has uh, uh, described, um, endowments, and in the context of extreme income in inequality, um, as I will point out, endowments uh, change their um, function and their role. So a, a bit of descriptive data um, from a paper that I published a half a year ago, uh, the bottom 90% of American, uh, if you take the top 120 institutions um, in terms of um, uh, size of their endowment, um, you get a 10% versus 90% uh, um, comparison. Um, the bottom 90% um, reach 60% of the total endowment money. The, the uh, top 10%, uh, about 45%. Uh, it changed a little bit in 2008 when they were hit very um, dramatically. The top 5% of the institutions um, uh, reach over, you know, 35% of the um, combined endowment. Um, if you look at all um, American higher education institutions, the top 1%, and here we're talking largely four institutions, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford, um, own uh, more than 60% of the combined um, endowment money. Uh, and, and as you see, that has you know, increased again with a slight hit after 2008. Um, um, <coughs> most disconcertingly is by simply by virtue of the mechanics of the financial markets, i.e. compound interest and a few other factors. That gap is going to increase dramatically in the next, you know, in the foreseeable future. Um, so uh, you have three particular effects going on. The virtuous cycle of prestige. Prestige begets prestige. People want to give money to, to uh, institutions that already are prestigious. The comp compound interest effect and the alternative investment effect um, and um, I'll just, you know, flip through these quickly here. Um, most scandalous gift ever given to a university, in this case Harvard, 400 million by John Paulson, who had made his money construing deceitful financial instruments and then gave that money to Harvard, um, who accepted it. Um, um, so 
Paulson made his money creating toxic assets, turning the investors' one billion loss into a one billion gain for Paulson. This is a quote from Jeffrey Sachs, well-known economist, graduate of Harvard, about uh, um, you know Paulson's. Um, <coughs> These are three different scenarios, you, uh, assuming 7, 10, and 12% annual return on um, the investment, where just by virtue of compound uh, interest, you have an increasingly large gap between Columbia University and Harvard, which is a case I, I go through in my, in my paper, um, as a particularly interesting one because, A, Columbia's endowment um, is as big as Harvard gained in endowment in one year, in the <laughs> year of 2000, 2007. Um, and uh, B, as um, uh, people have pointed out, um, the main thing that you will find as this gap grows is that the four um, um, top universities, again, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and, and uh, Stanford, uh, will basically uh, become untouchable for anyone else, including the Chicago's, the Cornell's, the Johns Hopkins, the, I mean, all the well-known universities. Uh, uh, they cannot, you know, and that kind of a disconnect um, will change, has to change the, the nature of American higher education um, simply by virtue of, um, of this here. Um, you know, David Reisman uh, talked about um, the academic procession in, the, in American higher education where the leading institutions are the head of the snake pulling along the body. And that has been a very important mechanism for, for the quality of American higher education, that even the, uh, you know, middle-ranked institutions, even the weaker institutions are part of this body that is being mo moved along. But once the head is disconnected from the, from the body, that will not, not happen again. And we will have um, uh, something like what they have in France, Grand École and the rest. That's a very different situation than what we have uh, had historically. All right, briefly, I think we have something similar going on in, in, in K-12 education um, uh, with um, you know, the, the shift uh, in quality assessments from um, uh, something that decision makers, uh, were, where decision makers were, were given uh, useful information from comparative assessments to um, an organization like PISA, which has no mandate in education. I mean, an organization like the OECD, which has no mandate in education, which, uh, whose purpose is the economic development um, of uh, um, you know, markets uh, in its name which has moved into, um, into education assessment and made it a completely different uh, um, instrument by introducing rankings. You know, Tim's, the near predecessor of PISA, never used rankings. They never said, you know, Singapore is up there and Germany is up there and Peru uh, is, is down there. But by virtue of doing that, they... Um, um, they changed uh, the game. They created a, a competition that is completely senseless for you know Germany to to become uh, um, you know competitive with Singapore or or, or Shanghai. So I, I wrote a letter. Uh, I, I drew up a letter four years ago after doing some research on this open letter to Andrea Schleicher. Um, Diane Ravitch and Noam Chomsky signed it, uh, and then 4,000, almost 4,000 others signed it. Um, Schleicher responded, well, it's all bunk. Um, but it did lead to uh, lots of people in lots of countries uh, writing to us saying, you know, um, this is the first time somebody's pointing out that um, uh, PISA is not a neutral technocratic quality assessment. It's, a, it's an interested, agenda-driven, namely, you know, I don't like to use the term very often, neoliberal agenda-driven instrument uh, to impose um, a certain kind of uh, uh, education on, on essentially uh, the world. Um, <coughs> very quickly, you see the enormous difference between TIMS um, um, or UNESCO's uh, Education for All, 
and PISA in terms of its you know, international echo when you do citation analyses. Um, so conclusion, um, we need to revise policy, we need to respond to power, we need to rethink civility. In terms of revising policy, um, maybe we can uh, save that for the um, uh, larger discussion later. Um, Piketty suggests a tax on endowments, which I think is a serious, is an idea we need to take very seriously. Right now, endowments are, you know, completely untaxed. Um, he suggests to leave uh, endowments under one billion alone, uh, a one percent on endowments uh, above a billion, and two percent above ten billion. That seems to me, you know, fairly, fairly reasonable. Um, we need to, I think, talk back to power more often uh, than we, we typically do. Um, we need to rethink the idea of civility, um, uh, connecting it with um, uh, um, the ancient discourse on, on virtue. Um, and I think we need to uh, come to a more constructive appreciation of the role of the state. Um, Ultimately, I see the civil society to, I, I see myself able to regain my faith in the civil society when we frame the civil society in this kind of a context where the state plays a constructive, important role where we, where we realize that civility uh, um, uh, benefits from well, from good government, uh, where markets are more effectively tamed where um, globalization is reflected uh, um, uh, and, and not uncritically uh, uh, welcome in all its, its uh, uh, ways, and where civility is, is uh, reconsidered uh, as, a, as part of the civic virtues. All right, thank you. <laughs>